1947, a group of atomic scientists, including Albert Einstein, started the symbolic doomsday clock to indicate how close we are to a human-induced global catastrophe because of nuclear war and, more recently, climate change. We are currently 90 seconds to midnight, the closest we've ever been to a global catastrophe. A couple of months ago, more recently, some of the biggest names in AI signed a short yet unsettling statement of a similar doomsday scenario about artificial intelligence. Mitigating the risk of extinction from artificial intelligence should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. And these risks of extinction are wide ranging and the hypotheses are endless, not too different from the science fiction movies like Terminator or Ex Machina that we've all seen. Because it could be that AI systems could be used to discover new deadly viruses and chemicals and bring about weapons of mass destruction. Or they can go about cracking open nuclear codes and in the hands of malicious actors, boom. Complete annihilation. End of humanity. How do you feel about that? Anxious? Uncomfortable? Frustrated? You all have every right to feel that way, but maybe not for the right reasons. While no one wants these apocalyptic futures to happen, AI is going to end us, these sensational predictions are creating a lot of noise, a lot of confusion, and are shifting our focus away from the actual risks that we should be worried about. And these risks are happening today, and we don't have good solutions for them. Unlike nuclear technology, AI is everywhere, and we don't even consider its presence at the moment. What with, with your movie recommendations on Netflix, or suggestions to follow a friend or a group on social media, or turning on your lights with a voice command, or creating an image with a textual prompt. And we have to remember that at the end of the day, AI, artificial intelligence, is a powerful combination of data and algorithms. That's about it. It's a powerful combination, and these algorithms are data hungry. They need massive amounts of data to do what they have to do, their intended jobs. And if you give them bad data, you get very bad results. Garbage in, garbage out. And there are so many risks associated with AI, especially the data risks. And one of the biggest risks you already probably know something about is data privacy. The consequences of this could be interesting. Some of it could range from the fact that you can have an awkward conversation with a friend because your kitchen gossip was sent to their phone accidentally. Or you might be giving away very sensitive military assets because of a social function of your fitness app. Or worse, you could completely weaken democratic election processes by manipulating voter behavior by playing on their deepest and darkest fears. And the other big risk comes from bias and stereotypes. Take me, for example. I was born and raised in India, but I spent most of my adult life in Europe. And when people approach me, they already have some preconceived notion about who I might be. And they approach me and they say that maybe I speak Indian and I might be working in the IT field. When I started a role in Sweden, I was actually referred to as that Indian girl who doesn't work for IT and she does yoga. Most of the time, these assumptions for me seem harmless and I go about to talk to them and say, hey, uh, Indian is not a language, and I don't necessarily work for IT. And the last one is kind of true. I do know some yoga. 
guilty. But you know, it's normal to have these stereotypes. We are human beings. When we approach somebody new, a new group, a new person, we, we estimate something about how they are or their behavior and how we make these estimations or assumptions about these people depends on a lot of things like how we grew up, the society around us, the movies we saw, or whatever else we were exposed to. Now, do an exercise with me. Close your eyes, all of you, for a second, and imagine a picture of a CEO of a company and a picture of a nurse working in a hospital. Take a second. I can assure you that more likely than not, you might have imagined a male CEO in your mind and a woman, a female nurse in your mind. But that doesn't feel so you know, good in terms of progress, does it? We are stereotyping people into professions. You know, men are uh, CEOs and women are nurses. But you can say, hey, we are human beings. We are not rational. You know, we make mistakes. We'll learn. We'll get better. But what if all these biases and stereotypes that we have are systematically incorporated into the artificial intelligence that we are building? What if they are programmed into that and we somehow attribute rationality to them? You guessed right. DALI, the generative uh, software of uh, image generator, also thinks the same thing. It thinks that a CEO can only be a man and a nurse is almost always a woman. And this is not just for images. You know, uh, even in ChatGPT, when I tried to give textual inputs, I asked a series of questions about a doctor and a nurse, same kind of questions, switching the role of a doctor and a nurse. Every answer it gives me, the doctor is always a he, a man, and a woman is the nurse. She's always a she, even when I use the same sentence construction. Okay, so a doctor is a man and a nurse is a woman. And these biases can cause real harm because a predictive policing algorithm, an algorithm was developed in the US to predict if somebody would commit a crime in future. It's called the risk of re-offense. And this algorithm was so biased that it was giving a very high risk of re-offense for a black woman compared to a white man, even though the white man had much more serious criminal record against him. That systematic bias we are programming into AI systems. And not too far from this is actually a big issue is incomplete or non-representative data. We call it the data gap, gender data gap or any other data gap. Where I can give you an example, like men and women, they have completely different symptoms for a heart attack. Men might have constricting chest pain, while women could have back pain, for instance. So historically, even human research I mean, I'm talking about, uh, we've collected a lot more data about men's ailments compared to women's ailments. So men's data is much more representative, complete, compared to women's. So when you build an AI app on top of this data, you might have also guessed it right. This is a true story. An AI company built an app that when you put in the symptoms, it will tell you what disease you have and what you need to do. For a man, it immediately told that person, rush to the hospital, this is a heart attack, don't wait home. And when a woman digited her symptoms of heart attack, said, panic attack, calm down. <laughs> so, and, and in this case, data gap can literally cost lives. So the importance of data, I would, cannot stress this enough. And relating to these risks that we are talking about, another big one is that of inclusion and equitable 
outcomes of who actually benefits from this progress. Even ChatGPT, I'm using this example too much, but it doesn't work so well in languages that are not English. It's very English-centric because we don't have enough data about other languages to train it so well. You know, you need large amounts of data. This will create a lot of problems, not just in terms of economic benefits, but also the cultural identities of you know, populations in a digital future. And not to mention the very high costs of training these models. People don't realize the environmental impact and the cost that goes behind training these large language models or generative models from hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars and the huge environmental impact of the computational power behind this. So every time you're using an app based on AI, there is a big environmental impact and these are the risks we need to be talking about today. No one is. We don't have enough solutions for that. And that's the noise we need to cut through because these risks are so current compared to the hypothetical bombarding situations. And Honestly, we could use this brilliant technology for so many glorious futures where AI could be our ally, a brilliant collaborator to fight against some of the grand and wicked problems we face as humankind. Because I can give you a utopian scenario for every apocalyptic scenario that you can promise me with, even the ones I started with. Take, for instance, drug discovery. Discovering new medicines takes more than 10 years because it's very hard to find new medicines for diseases. But with AI, you can do it in 30 days, less than a month. Imagine the possibilities for rare diseases, neglected diseases, and a whole frontier of personalized medicine with AI. The United Nations has big hopes for AI. They think that they even have written a report that it can help in their peacekeeping efforts because it can predict conflict. It can help them to translate, understand the local situation, engage with the stakeholders, and you know, also facilitate rescue operations more easily. And experts believe that AI is an indispensable tool in our fight against climate change because its computational power will help us to understand the enormous and complex climate data sets and variables and interactions to predict what's going to happen and how to work with that. And not to mention, you can also use it to you know, find climate-friendly materials. And of course, the big price everybody is after AI is the economic reward, PwC, predicts that AI will contribute $15.7 trillion to the global economy by 2030. It's a few years from now. And the biggest winners of this prize are United States, China, and Europe. And naturally, all the other countries want to have a cake of this, you know, piece of this cake of progress. So the attitudes towards these risks of AI are very different across countries. And if you look at it, emerging economies like India, Brazil, and South Africa are very enthusiastic to adopt AI, and their willingness to trust is very, very high compared to the Western economies. So having said this, there is really no stopping AI. This, we can't say, OK, we have to stop this. No. But if we want to avoid an AI apocalypse and achieve all the enthusiastic AI benefits and utopian scenarios that we talked about, we must set up guardrails. There are some early indications of progress in this. Uh, the EU has approved a first draft regulation for AI. How should and should not, we should not use this technology. And the number of bills and regulations uh, across the world about how do we deal with this technology is continuously increasing every day. I have to admit, regulation will be very complex for this technology because it's rapidly evolving. What we studied one month ago is not current the day after, but we need to start somewhere to understand how to dynamically deal with the situation. And the most important thing is awareness that we are focusing on the wrong things, the noise and the confusion, the sensationalism. And we have to truly understand the risks and benefits of AI because it's a double-edged sword. That's what it is. Firstly, to start with, we need to have better data. I cannot stress this enough. Better data. 
representative data, compliant, privacy-friendly data, robust data. We need robust models, AI models, with mechanisms to evaluate and test their performance and safety. And we need global regulation, global action together, like we have from, for climate change or nuclear technology, because, you know, AI is going to impact every human being on Earth. With that, I want to conclude with my favorite quote from Noam Chomsky. We have two choices. We can be pessimistic, give up and help ensure that the worst will happen. Or we can be optimistic, grasp the opportunities that surely exist, and maybe make the world a better place. Not much for choice, is it? Thank you.